Welcome to Agatha Christie, She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of the mystery genre's greatest writer. I'm Bill Peschel of Peschel Press, publishers of the annotated novels of Agatha Christie, and today we're talking about subdivided chateaus, dolls stuffed up chimneys, drunken priests, and child murders. It's Mon Petit de Mitzi, the 2005 French adaptation of the Tommy and Tuppence novel by the pricking of my thumbs. But first, let me introduce my partner in marriage, as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa Peschel. Teresa, how are you doing today? Hi, Bill. <laughs> as you can probably tell from my voice, I'm still suffering from this terrible head cold. And no, folks, we're pretty sure it's not COVID because our dear son who brought it home to us, he shared it with us what he learned at college took his COVID test and he was negative. So since he's the only person we see outside of our household who goes out into the world, we know he gave it to us. So it's one of a million upper respiratory tract infections and it will work its way out. But yes, I'm looking forward to uh, the pricking of my thumbs. I had no idea what to expect because, you know, hey, it's French. And it was great. It was surprisingly funny. I am sure that I missed half the jokes because we were reading the subtitled version. And of course, everybody is jabbering away in French at top speed. And I am positive that we missed jokes and sly innuendo and clever repartee. We missed all kinds of stuff because we were relying on indifferent English subtitles instead of the witty and sparkling dialogue that they were obviously doing. And there were visual jokes. I think we would have to watch it a second time to pick up on all of the visual jokes, maybe even a third. And again, some of the jokes probably don't show up if you don't speak French. There was one particular instance, it was near the beginning, in which Tommy and Tuppence, uh, this is Prudence and Belisar Beresford. They kept the last name at least. So we have Prudence and Belisar, and they're in their French chateau. A very nice chateau, by the way. A very big chateau. And he's at his desk typing away, and she is doing something with a incense burner is all I could assume that it is because she was she lit something that almost was cigar like and then put it inside this black bird this this raven and it was putting up smoke curls of smoke curls into the of air. smoke so it must be incense something to refresh the air she's walking away and he's busy writing and he's kind of annoyed with her because she's focusing on this visit to the rest home and this woman that she met there and, and he is very busy and we'll get to that absolutely and she turns around and she sees and she sees and she comments that you're you're really thinking hard because your little gray cells are smoking and the camera cuts back and from the angle it looks like his there's smoke coming out of his head it is so funny i mean there was so much in this movie that was funny we open with them in their open convertible driving down the sunny roads in the south of France. And this does not look like the English countryside. I can't really tell you why, well, except part it of just it, didn't look English. Part of it, it's in the Saxon, if I'm getting this right, it's not the, not the Saxony region. It's the Savoy region of France, which is right on the border with Switzerland and Italy. So you're looking at the Alps. So that's why we have this flat land and suddenly something that looks like the Rocky Mountains, only oh, everything is green. Okay. But they're on their way to the rest home where Aunt Ada is staying, Tommy's aunt, and Tuppence's, uh, and we're going to stick with the English names here, folks, because it's just so much easier. And that way I don't mangle the pronunciation. But Tuppence is already not looking forward to meeting Aunt Ada, because Aunt Ada thinks of her as being that tart, that woman who's no better than she should be. And, you know, why on earth did you marry that woman? Are you sure you're married to that woman? Aunt Ada, uh, when you read the novel, the Dr. Murray makes a point of telling Tommy that she was really very sharp. Just in case you hadn't realized that, she was very sharp. She liked to pretend she was senile. She liked to pretend she was senile because it amused her and she didn't have much to amuse herself anymore. You see Aunt Ada and what a wonderful scene with Tuppence, that tart, that stripper throat that you picked up in some bar in Tangiers, the what on earth are you doing here? And Tuppence gracefully uh, removes herself from the removes scene. Removes herself from the scene. The entire chateau is what you would want your elderly relatives to live at. It was a castle with a devoted staff ready to put up with any eccentricity from the, the guests. They had their animals, they had pet dogs, they had 
goldfish. They had monkey. Uh, a monkey. They had they had birds in cages. I'm sure there were cats, although I don't recall seeing any. They had birds in cages brought out on the lawn, and they had someone with their monkey on a leash. They were walking the monkey around, and the monkey even gets some scenes where it looks like he is drinking somebody's abandoned um, milk carton, milk carton, and then he's sleeping it off in the sun. It just implies that somebody was doctoring it. Yes, it does. And so much of it, like Mrs. this is Mrs. Carraway swallowing the thimble right out of the novel. This is one of the novels that Agatha wrote towards the end of her life. It was published in 1968, which meant she wrote it in 1967. Uh, traditional publishing, there's always like a year or more between the writing and the publication. You could tell that she was not on her game, but at the same time, there are still some amazingly astute observations of life and the world and what do you do with your elderly relatives. And she would have appreciated this wonderful chateau that is devoted to catering to elderly people who can't live on their own anymore. I just, it, 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 there was just like all of these little jokes all around. And I am sure I missed half of them. There were some, and there were some other oddities as well, because Tommy is a member of the security, some, kind of, some security organization. Think MI5. He's still a member of MI5, somewhere up there. Yeah, that would be it. And he's having to deal with conference and position papers and all the bureaucracy of being in a security official. And yet at the same time, they're sitting at this conference room, which looks like it's to be inside of spaceship. This is one of those French modernist architectural pieces that, that Oh look, yeah, they had some bizarre architecture inside. Yeah. And the, uh, it's, it's very, nothing like a chateau. It's very uh, patriarchal because all the officials are men. And, and wearing gas masks. Well, and they were wearing gas masks around the table. And they, apparently they were like testing gas masks, I And guess. they're being served by pretty young ensigns, pretty young secretaries, who are not wearing gas masks and as it, they hand out the drinks and the wine. Yeah. And then, of course, after you have the conference, you go to lunch, where I'm sure the food in this cafeteria outclasses any cafeteria in the entire United States, and you have more wine yeah, more with wine. it. Yes, very French. It's very and it, French. It, it reminded me of when I was in, uh, when I was stationed in Sink Pack Fleet in Hawaii. Fleet Week. This is when uh, the United States Navy does this huge, they do ship operations. I can't even remember the vocabulary for this anymore, but they do. Okay, this is Fleet Week. Is this in Norfolk or Hawaii? No, this is in Hawaii. This is Hawaii. Okay. This is in Hawaii. Sorry, this is in, this in, in Hawaii. And this is when you have uh, so military you maneuvers with another allied army you're practicing your uh, uh whatever it is that they did and i remember being told that it was a treat to go on board one of the french ships because they had wine in the mess whereas the united states navy is a dry navy because they are not going to put wine on the mess in the mess on a daily basis you told me that they did they didn't even have beer except under certain circumstances oh yeah beer day uh when you have been out in the navy when you've been out at sea for six months without a port call you have beer day uh everyone on the ship can sign up for two one for one or two cans of beer you have to drink them on the spot you cannot take them and hide them in your locker for, for later consumption that is a long time that you have to wait I was reminded there were uh, memoirs. I think it was Peter Mayle who was talking about daycare centers in France that serve meals to the kids. And they were still, they we're not talking Lunchables. Oh, They're no, it is it is top quality food. It, it is a different culture. The French have a different culture from the United States or from the English. Just seeing that all of these business, you know, all of these important military <clears throat> security policemen types, they have wine as part of their beverage to wet their throat during this important meeting and then they have more wine at lunch and yet no one gets drunk that it is just very different it seems very civilized and very adult at the same time oh yes very uh, much so now the security organization thing this whole subplot didn't really have much to do. It was basically a way of getting Tommy out of the picture so that Tuppence, who meets up with Rose Evangelista. That's Mrs. Lancaster in the novel. Okay, she meets up with her in the rest home, and he point, she points to the fireplace and asks if your child was the one that was buried behind the fireplace. And then she suddenly disappears. There's also a painting involved that Tuppence thought that she had seen somewhere before that belongs to 
It was to aunt. It was the aunt, right? Uh, it was it, Mrs. Lancaster gave it to Aunt Ada, and by the way, the plot of the movie follows the novel actually really quite closely as these adaptations go. You see a lot more of Tommy's dealings with MI5 than you did in the novel, but that is what he was doing. He was spending time with the older general, who did remember Aunt Ada as being a really hot cookie when they were both young and fresh. That was one of the things that that shows up here is is Agatha Christie looking back on life. Oh, yes. um, At this time, she was like 77 when she wrote this. Yeah, a long time ago. So it would be apparent that she would be reflecting back on when she was a young girl. And, uh, you know, slender and red haired and And, and just absolutely hot. And now and you look at. When you look at the pictures of Agatha Christie, the one that you standard, the standard pictures that you see, she looks like an old woman. And you don't see the young woman that she was when she was fresh and hot and was in Egypt and had 17 suitors and nine marriage proposals. You don't see that. She comments on that in By the Pricking of My Thumbs. You know, as Tommy considers what the general is saying about Aunt Ada as being, wow, fresh and hot and lively and how much she liked robust young lieutenants. <laughs> Time makes fools of us all. It was surprising how closely this followed the novel. I would say that the major changes were more silliness and that when Tuppence and Tommy are back in the little village of Sutton Chancellor, uh, whatever it is that they're calling it in French, I don't know, that they have a fete going on, a village fete, to add more color and more background. And of course, the other change is having their daughter and son-in-law and two rambunctious twin sons move in because their own house is having things done and, well, Tuppence can't get out of there fast enough. <laughs> that was also, yeah, she had no design, no desire to be a grandmother to them. And it's you, it's funny, you could actually see there's, a, there's an actual animosity, friendly animosity between the mother and the daughter. And again, you wonder how reflective this can be of, of Agatha's own relationship with her daughter rosalind well this is all from the script writer so we don't oh, know that doesn't that wasn't in the novel no oh, no okay. no no uh they had nobody move in with them while they were at uh while they were doing this case okay deborah is or whichever daughter it is deborah are it does not move in this is an ad this mm-hmm. is an addition that the script writer put in for extra voom i guess for extra va va voom but it is an interesting relationship. Maybe it does reflect what the scriptwriter knew about Agatha's own relationship with Rosalind. They didn't have the close emotional bond that Agatha had with her own mother. It was a more distant relationship. Yeah. But it does show up here, and it shows up when the husband moves in their luggage and breaks a side table, apparently putting a case on it. And Tuppence is saying, you know, why did you do that? That table had held Voltaire's pen and Colette's pen, somebody's coffee, pen, cup, somebody's coffee, coffee cup, cup, and somebody's opium pipe. Three oh, was- different great f- names was in r- French literature. References. Yeah, De Quincey's opium pipe, because he wrote, Confessions of an Opium Eater. Yes, three great literary references. And again, I am sure that this is loaded with jokes for a French audience. Well, and it just, everything looks so lived in as well, because the Chateau had all kinds of junk that they have from their adventures. A there's lifetime papers of accumulation. everywhere. There's even a, well, there's a romantic scene. I wouldn't want to call it a sex scene, because sex does not occur on Screen, on screen between it Tommy does not and occur Tuppence. on screen but, but it shows the that you can be a 60 year old couple and still have a hot life she's laying in bed you know thanking him for showing her a wonderful time and he's off at the other side ironing his shirt because he's having to prepare to go up go off to uh, Lyon. and she compliments him on his ironing as well so it, it, this has a very lived in look it's reminiscent of the early marples where they look more like they just moved the cameras into the village and shot what they saw rather than having everything prepared and carefully mowed oh, and carefully yes. laid out. Oh, yes. I had forgotten. When you compare the Joan Hickson marples to the Geraldine and Julia marples, it is like night and day in the backdrops. They're always set in the 50s. Both series did the same thing. But in Joan Hickson, 
it doesn't look like the grass was freshly vacuumed the buildings don't look like they have just been pressure washed and the people look like actual people with actual stuff whereas in the marple episodes wow everything is so pristine it's like they just took the shrink wrap off it's like the couple in a murder is announced the way their farm looked in the joan hickson version looked like this is they somebody, lived in a single wide. They, they were, were poor people. They were poor people. And, the and other they lived one, in a single wide. And then you move to the Marple version and suddenly they both get Hollywood facelifts. They look much younger, much more attractive in every single way, much less human. And they live in a castle. It was a very nice house. I wished we lived in a house like that. <laughs> Those cobblestones had been freshly pressure washed. This is supposed and to be a did. farm. And there was not a speck of manure anywhere but getting back to picking anyway. <laughs> up, up my thumbs but this is this is the whole feeling of of the movie and the comedy scenes played out during the first two-thirds of it and it was just there to kind of lend a little bit of levity a little bit of uh, you know a dash of a spice because it fades as they get closer and closer to the end there's there's no comedy after that because we are talking serious child murders here again you can tell that this is one of her older novels and she didn't get the editing that she should have gotten but in thumbs there are at least five maybe six child murders that, that happened 20 years before. that happened 20 years previous and i know that agatha does have trouble with bus schedules because it really should have been 30 or 40 based on the age of mrs lancaster but there were at least five, maybe six, maybe seven child murders where a seven-year-old girl, an eight-year-old girl, a nine-year-old girl in the village would disappear. And they would find her body eventually strangled. And this was over about seven or eight months. And what you discover is that Mrs. Lancaster had been murdering the girls as sacrifices and to make her own aborted daughter to give her friends, to give her companions and when her husband discovered what was going on he did not have her arrested instead he had her because he had money and he had status and power and remember rules for thee but not for me he moved her into a series of nursing homes to protect her reputation even though she basically had no reputation to be protected because of course she had also been a flighty dancer and associated with jewel thieves and this is the fault in the novel as soon as tuppence arrived in sutton chancellor and started being told this backstory she should have remembered because i guarantee you even in a little rural out of the way place that nobody knows about if you have seven little girls murdered within seven months and their strangled bodies found it would have been in every newspaper in the country for months and every single person in the village would have known it would not be something they had to think about to remember sometimes when writers write they don't necessarily think about that kind of structure but that's what would have happened and there are other deaths in the novel, too. This is why it's so maddening when people say, oh, Agatha Christie writes cozies. She doesn't. And this is not a cozy. This is tragic. You've got five or six or seven little girls murdered as a result of a woman going off her head because of her abortion and then on being unable to bear children later. And she also murders at least two other people old ladies in nursing homes who recognize her from her past but you've got at least eight or nine deaths was there any murders in this novel i mean in the movie that we saw no nobody is actually okay. well no the closest we would come to is probably aunt ada true she saw true. something but it was but although it they said the doctor and we said it was know natural, that so. dr murray said mrs moody was murdered with morphine right. she died and he couldn't understand why she died because she was perfectly healthy right and right. he got the family to let him do an autopsy because you know when somebody dies in their sleep we like to make sure that they to to, to find out the exact cause of death and he discovered it was a massive overdose of morphine so the majority of the movie takes place in the village with tuppence because tommy is off at the conference and he's trying to catch up with tuppence and tuppence is in the village basically digging into the background of there's the house that is subdivided down the middle that Which she has found she has found the house she found and, the house in the painting and the odd people who are living in one half and the other half is abandoned right and it's it's a very peculiar house in that normally when a house is divided it's divided from front 
to back. So you have two front doors and two back doors. The two houses are side by side. This house has been divided lengthways. So you have the front of the house and then you have the back of the house as being separate. And that is very different. And the rich, expensive, fancy part is the front part. And that's the part that's abandoned. And the back of the house is where Amos and Alice Perry, and they are the only two people whose names were not changed for the French adaptation. And I have no idea why, because I wouldn't have thought that Alice and Amos Perry were French names, but there you go. Maybe it was a joke, mm -hmm. you know, like the joke about the Swiss farmers, which I won't bother going into, which was obviously a French slur against Swiss farmers. Yep. I was told by the uh, brother-in-law when uh, they came to visit Tommy and Tuppence oh, at their no, chateau. Oh, not the brother-in-law, the son-in-law. Son-in-law, right, son-in-law. Son yeah. But yeah, most of the movie takes place in, it's either at the nursing home, it's Tommy's conferences, and then in the village as Tuppence is exploring, and she is looking at graves to help the vicar who has bad knees and is a drunk. A pussy cat distracts her, then she gets coshed in the head. Yep. And she wakes up in a hospital and her wallet has been rifled through. All her paperwork has been removed. And she lied to the bed and breakfast owner as to what her name is is Livingstone. and so they didn't know what her name was they thought it was mrs livingstone but that wasn't her and that also allowed them to do dr livingston or mr livingston, livingston I, joke, presume. I presume jokes yeah when when tommy shows up it just really tied together because of course tuppence discovers the jewels inside the the doll and it turns out that not tommy's main concern but tommy is trying to find tuppence and he meets the uh an old friend the police inspector and he realizes based on his uh work with mi5 that the lawyer he just spoke to is under surveillance why is the lawyer under surveillance well his friend the police commissioner will certainly tell him and they say well we know he is of interest we can't prove it well he was involved in a jewel theft like eight to ten years ago yes a major jewel theft and, and the, most of the gang was put in prison except for him and they're trying to find and now they're out so they're monitoring him so that they could find out where the jewels are these are very valuable very important jewels apparently yes and then tuppence finds them inside of a doll in the vacant front half of the mysterious house in the painting which they never quite explained how it got there. I can see the how you, you, you're you hiding it. So you put the jewels inside of a doll. I mean, it's kind of silly. And stuff it up the chimney? And stuff it up the chimney. But it means that nobody is going to look. Nobody is mm -hmm. going to see it. And because it's an abandoned house, nobody is going to set a fire in the chimney mm -hmm. where you're going to realize that the, there there's a problem with the draw of the chimney and you open up the damper and, and, and you know you do things like that. Well, of course, and the house was owned by the twin to the lawyer. Exactly. Who happens to be the wife, uh, the husband of Rose Evangelista. Yes. Oh, and that's somebody we have to bring out. She's Rose Evangelista in the film. She's Mrs. Lancaster in the novel. So I want to make that clear. And she is played by Genevieve Bujold. And you can still see how beautiful Genevieve Bujold was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. How old was she when she made this movie? Oh, uh, that is a good question. I'll have to look that up. I'll have to insert that in. Uh, <laughs> she, she's one of the big names in the English-speaking world. She's probably the only big name in this, this movie. The only person that an English-speaking audience would recognize. Well, she was a Canadian actress. I mean, she's French. Uh, she was born in Montreal. Ah, Quebec. In Quebec. And she's 80 now, so you have to kind of go backwards. 75 then? Well, if she's 80 now, then we're talking 2005, so we're talking 17 years. So 63? About 63 or so. It was startling. And one of the interesting things about having somebody like Genevieve Bujold play a role like that is you might know who she is, and so you look at her and you think how beautiful she is, how beautiful she was, she was. and what time did to her. I think this is a wonderful serendipitous bit of casting, because that a lot of the pricking of my thumbs is Agatha as an older woman in her 70s, reminiscing about what time does, the passage of time, how it alters you, even though you still feel young and fresh and vibrant inside your outer shell doesn't look like that anymore 
None of us exactly. look like what we did, you know, 30 years ago. Yes, although we still have the same feelings and emotions that we did 30 years ago as well. But yes, time makes fools of us all. I'm afraid so. I was surprised at, at how well this came out. So there are now, to my knowledge, there are two filmed versions of By the Pricking of My Thumbs. The other film of the novel is, of course, a Marple episode. That turned out surprisingly well. They changed it up considerably more than this one did. Mm -hmm. And yet I would say that that one is worth watching too, to see Miss Marple and Tuppence solving the case. And Tommy, basically everything that Tommy did was handed over to Miss Marple. And a lot of what uh, Tuppence did was handed over to Miss Marple because, of course, she's the headliner. And yet that version, very different from this version, still worked for me. That was done the next, the following year, 2006, with uh, Anthony Andrews as Tommy and Greta Sachi as Tuppence. And I remember she was an alcoholic at that. Yeah, they made her into an alcoholic. And maybe the script writer saw the French version and saw that they had a glass of wine at every opportunity and ran with that idea. But that's the one thing I couldn't buy about that particular episode. Tuppence would never have become a lush because she was bored. She would have written racy novels and published them under a pen name, and she would have organized everyone around her for miles. Yeah, she would have figured something out. She would have figured something out. Because this Tuppence is just as headstrong, and Tommy couldn't have stopped her if he tried. Exactly. Because she was just determined to go off and, and hair off. And she did. She haired off and didn't leave word behind. And when she wasn't checking in, he had to go off after her. When she didn't check in, he knew something was wrong. Yeah. Because as Tommy says to whoever it was he was talking to in the French version, I trained her myself. She knows how to check in. Yeah. And even she says, you know, it's, it's tough living with a husband who knows you as well as you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yourself, exactly. So. And then, of course, we reach the ending when it's discovered that Mrs. Lancaster, the Rose Evangelista character, is not a sweet, dotty old lady who's in danger. She is the danger. She lived an extremely exciting life. She was the last member of a very inbred family. She was a dancer. She had an abortion, but it was apparently botched, and she wasn't able to have children later on when she finally got did get married, and it was devastating to her. And then she started murdering little girls to provide companions for her own dead daughter. They were sacrifices, you know, sacrifices of atonement. And you have to be pretty crazy to think that murdering more children is going to improve anything. And she murders people in nursing homes and she has to be moved occasionally from one nursing home to the next because she's recognized for one reason or another. And it turns out that her husband is the twin brother of the mysterious lawyer, who is the mastermind behind the jewel thieves. So it all ties up, and it does tie up rather similarly to the novel. And like the novel, it almost has a non-ending. It's not a dramatic ending with gunfire and a Mexican standoff, like some of the Poirot episodes where everybody is holding a gun on everybody else. It's not like that. Yeah, the police come in and arrest her and, you know, basically arrest everybody. And it's a well, they don't arrest, well, they don't arrest she her. She, 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 she commits right. suicide. She drinks the poisoned milk that she was going to make Tuppence drink. And you never get explanations for some of the weirdnesses, such as the, the house, the vacant half of the house is filled with all of these Virgin Mary statues of various sizes, which was really strange it was that one room and yes there's no explanation no for explanation that. for that you're never given an explanation for why tommy and his mi5 gang as they're discussing uh security in france are all wearing gas masks you're never given an explanation for that it uh, just is and also the front of the house where she was mrs lancaster slash evangelista was living seemed to have trick doors it was a pretty impressive house she it was a up- very impressive house and they were working remarkably well considering that the house had been abandoned but maybe that's also a reminder that the house even though it looked abandoned wasn't abandoned because if you know that you have secret passageways and secret hidey holes you want to keep them keep those mechanisms working so that you can hide your stolen gems Mm -hmm. so when the police come looking for it As far as they're concerned, this is an abandoned house, and they'll look through it, but they don't expect there to be a hidden passageway. 
Yeah, which is what uh, Rose uses to lure Tuppence into the house and up the stairs and trap her in the bedroom. You don't realize this in the film. It's implied in the novel. She grew up in that house. Ah, okay. She knows that house. She knows every inch of that house. When Tuppence finds her quite by accident in the, the abandoned front half of the house, she knows who Tuppence is, but all Tuppence sees is this sweet, dotty old lady. Yeah. And she holds out the glass of milk. She wants Tuppence to drink it. And it suddenly becomes very creepy. It'll be easier for you if you die this way. <laughs> and I guess she remembers holding little girls down, strangling them. Mm -hmm. Then she poisons herself. And her husband is grief-stricken. Her husband's twin brother, the lawyer, he also, apparently she was one of those women that she had a lure, a magnetism, because her husband couldn't walk away. Her husband couldn't turn her into the police. He had to protect her. His twin brother, who is a criminal mastermind behind his facade of being a completely 100% respectable lawyer, couldn't turn her in. He helped cover things up and then he committed suicide while in police custody rather than reveal the information. Everybody is covering up for Mrs. Lancaster. She's a murderess, a multiple murderess. She murders children and other little old ladies, and yet that's okay. She's what's important, not those other people. Those people don't matter. And even at the very end, her husband is still so entranced with her that Miss Bly, a single woman who is the village go-getter and his secretary, who has helped him cover all of this up, who did it because she is passionately in love with him he doesn't see her he doesn't see miss bly at all she doesn't matter other than as a useful tool compared to how he feels about mrs lancaster who murdered children his his true love who murdered children yeah so it ends in a tragedy it's a tragedy, tragedy all around everybody it's not a cozy <laughs> No, Agatha is a lot tougher than she looks. Oh my gosh, yes. The Tommy and Tuppence movies in France, there were three of them directed by Pascal Thomas. There's this one from 2005, and then there is a version of the 450 at Paddington in 2008. Wait, with Tommy and Tuppence? With Tommy and Tuppence, if I, uh, call, if I call that right. Let me just make sure, because that's what, yeah, a faithful adaptation of the 450 from Paddington. With Tommy and Tuppence. With, How could yes. it be a faithful adaptation with Tommy and well, Tuppence? I don't know. It's Crime is Our Business. And then there was a 2012 movie, Partners in Crime, which have nothing to do with the short story collection, and apparently is a more original story. And that one was not as good as the others. So well, can we get the 450 from Paddington? I don't know. I have to look at. I'll have to look it up and see. Because I think that I would could. be interesting to see. Because then that would be the fourth version of the 450 from Paddington that we've seen. Okay, and in between, Pascal Thomas also directed Toward Zero. Well, that one I definitely want to see because the only version, English language version that I've seen of Toward Zero was the Marple episode. Again, that was surprisingly good. Uh, Miss Marple replaced Superintendent Battle completely, and it was surprisingly good. Yeah, unfortunately, I've not seen an English language version of this Toward Zero of Pascal Thomas. Hopefully, someday somebody will decide. Yes, and let let me say now, if any producers are of any of these films are listening, you know you are missing a bet because the English speaking Agatha Christie fan market would probably be very interested in watching these films if they were released either dubbed or with subtitles. Yes. And you make them services. available on streaming services. Yep. So this concludes this episode of Agatha Christie. She watched, as you can tell, we definitely recommend checking this movie out. Oh, it was a lot of fun. It was, it really was fun. It was loaded with visual jokes and very French uh, humor, very French humor, a sparkling repartee. It just worked. It worked all the way throughout. And it even had a kitty in the middle of it that uh, distracted Truppence just long enough so that she could get coshed on the head. Yep. So until next time, this is Bill Peschel. And I'm Teresa Peschel. And remember to visit our website if you want to see our upcoming events so you can meet us in person. Absolutely. And we'll see you at the movies. Agatha Christie, she watched, is Teresa Peschel and Bill Peschel. Produced by Bill Peschel. Theme song, Call to Adventure, by Kevin McLeod. 
New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to peschel at peschelpress.com. And thank you for listening.